and welcome to Viewpoint on Ukraine Today. My name is Tamara Rosevan. Ukraine's visa-free bid has been at the top of the agenda for the government. Joining us to discuss the issues surrounding the EU visa-free deal is Ukraine's ambassador at large, Dmitro Kuleba. Welcome to Viewpoint. Thank you. So I understand there's been various reports of when Ukraine will get its visa-free uh, regime. Um, Ukraine's Foreign Minister Pavlo Klimkin said that he expects the EU to provide visa-free regime to Ukraine by July 2016. But um, how close is Ukraine really to getting it? Just a couple of steps away from it. Uh, Ukraine has done a tremendous work to meet the criteria and implement standards necessary for the introduction of visa-free regime with the European Union. Now there is a will from on both sides, from the European side and from the Ukrainian side, to see a visa-free regime functioning uh, for the benefit of Europeans. So uh, we just have to finalize what has not been done yet, and these are two major things which uh, are first the draft law, the law on uh, e-declarations, electronic declarations, and uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, National Agency for the Prevention of Corruption. These two things should come in place, should come to existence. And this will be a major, this will be two major steps uh, towards the visa liberalization with Europe. I see. So some of, some of the, the two points that you mentioned, one of them is uh, to fight corruption through this uh, e -dec declaration. Yeah. Both of them are related to anti-corruption efforts and mechanisms. And I see uh, commitment and will uh, in Ukraine and I see it da daily, seeing how my colleagues work. I see their will to finalize this process and uh, to reach the goal we've been kind of uh, striving for for years. Mm. But apart from that, the EU has been kind of hesitant to uh, uh, grant Ukraine this um, visa-free lib liberalization, or so some officials in Parliament say, um, as a result of uh, the conflict in, in Donbass, because Ukraine hasn't been able to reach uh, a deal which will see a permanent and lasting ceasefire in the East. Now, uh, and the EU is also asking that Ukraine um, implements the Minsk agreements, which includes uh, granting the occupied Donetsk and Luhansk regions of self-governance. Well, Minsk process and visa liberalization process are two different processes. That's clear. And they don't affect each other. They do not affect each other. Uh, they could have affected each other in a sense if Ukraine uh, was not able to control internal migration. But we, have dem uh, and, but we have demonstrated to the European Union and to the world that uh, Ukraine is capable of managing more than a million of internally displaced persons who do not stay uh, on the border with the European Union try, trying to cross it. We absorbed all these people and we helped them inside the country. So the argument that Ukraine poses a migration risk for the European Union is absurd because uh, the reality check proves the opposite. Uh, we also have to understand, and uh, Moldova and Georgia examples are very clear, that the existence of a conflict on the territory of of the country cannot be considered as a, a major obstacle to introducing the visa-free regime because one of the things is that the conflict is in the eastern part of Ukraine while the western border with the European Union properly ma equipped and managed is thousands of kilometers away from it. Look at Moldova with Transnistria, look at Georgia with uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Uh, Moldova already enjoys visa-free regime, and Georgia is on its way to it. Um, Georgia is um, expecting to... Um, Georgia and Ukraine have been decoupled as the two countries. Uh, this, this term, which has been used in the EU, it has been de decoupled. So their bid for visa-free uh, regime has, is, is being looked at separately. That, now, do you think that this is concerning, that this will potentially somehow influence U Ukraine's bid? No, it is not. It's a technical decision. It has no dramatic or tragic consequences for us. And uh, these two applications can be still reunited at the later stage. I see. And uh, so this, this doesn't put Ukraine's bid under any s more, under more scrutiny or in a way? Uh, no, it does not complicate things to the level where uh, goal becomes unachievable. 
Mm -hmm. Now, on April 6th, uh, there's going to be a Dutch referendum um, on uh, a key EU deal with, with Ukraine, the uh, EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. Now, the voters will be asked uh, whether they support or oppose the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. Now, um, is Ukraine's uh, visa-free bid, and will this be affected by this um, referendum, essentially? The functioning of the European Union is in the hands of the Europeans themselves, including the Dutch. So, in this sense, the referendum is a domestic uh, Dutch affair. And I would like to point uh, that the main target of this referendum is not Ukraine, but the European Union itself. It's the relationship between the Dutch people and the European institutions that uh, led to the referendum. But isn't that what the Dutch want? Uh, to uh, want others to believe that, that this is more about Euro skepticism and not about Ukraine's uh, conflict and, U and the issues that Ukraine is facing? Well, this is the truth. I mean, this is the reality. It is, it is about European skepticism, and Ukraine was picked up as a soft target for that, unfortunately. And this is what we are trying now to explain to the Dutch that, guys, do not kill uh, a European nation because you do not like European institutions. That's, these are two different stories. But when you ask about visa liberalization, uh, first, the outcome of the referendum cannot uh, stop the visa liberalization process. But uh, the argument our opponents in the Netherlands use regularly is that visa-free regime will open Europe and the Netherlands to the waves of the millions of Ukrainian migrants flowing into the European Union, taking jobs, and uh, raising criminal rates and all that kind of negative scenario cases. But this is not going to happen. There are, the, the, first, I have already mentioned that Ukraine effectively absorbs and manages internal dis, internally displaced persons. Second, Ukraine is not a channel of illegal migration from Syria because, you know, the, the flows are going through different countries. And third, uh, we do not have any kind of claims to the Netherlands about migration flows and uh, their job, uh, jobs. So this is a political argument, but it is not supported by facts. And this is what we are trying to explain to them, to the Dutch people, that Ukraine poses no threat. It is not a threat, it's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Uh, very interesting. Um, the referendum is actually an, an advisory one. Now, can you kind of explain to our viewers what that means? Um, I understand it's, it's, not, um, it's not binding, but the government will consider the decision. Well, it's about uh, political traditions and political culture in the Netherlands. So it will be in the hands of the government of the Netherlands uh, to either accept the result or to not to accept it. Uh, I can hardly imagine a European politician who ignores the opinion of its uh, people. Even if we take a simple fact, the, inc the upcoming elections in the Netherlands. But uh, let's wait and see. We are working now to bust myth, to repel all this, uh, some absurd arguments against Ukraine and to explain to the Dutch people what Ukraine is about, uh, that it deserves support and not uh, opposition. I see. Uh, now, if uh, the, the majority of voters will vote no, um, according to a, a poll um, conducted in January, um, a majority of Dutch voters opposed uh, the Netherlands' rat ratification of the European Union's association agreement with Ukraine. This is according to uh, a broadcasting program, Jen Van Dag. Um, if Dutch voters do oppose the agreement. What will that actually mean? Uh, let's wait until it happens. We, wor we, we work hard, as I said, to explain the essence of the association agreement to the Dutch voters. Uh, and I would like to point here also that Ukraine is not part of the, this election process officially. So it's not the, it's not the government has no uh, effective tools to actually uh, campaign inside the Netherlands. We, are, we abide by Dutch law and in no way try to impose our opinion and thinking on the Dutch people. But the major efforts are now being undertaken to explain to the Dutch 
uh, that there is nothing they should be afraid about and that Ukraine should not fall a victim of the Euroscepticism. So let's wait until the 6th of uh, April and so then we will be able to comment on the results of the referendum and what's going to happen next. Okay, well, we'll be uh, looking out for that. Thank you so much for coming into our studio. Thank you. This has been Mr. Dmitry Kuleba, Ukraine's ambassador at large. You've been watching Viewpoint on Ukraine today.